Welcome back. In the last video, what we did is we looked at affinity constants, and we effectively got an expression for theta. And we said that theta, we defined it as the uh, the proportion, or the um, the or we we called it the quotient, or the um, the ratio of 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 ligand bound proteins to the actual total protein concentration. Okay, and we effectively got it in the form. Okay, we got we got theta in the form of the concentration of the ligand divided by the concentration of the ligand plus the dissociation constant. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to apply this to um, cooperative ligand binding. Okay, now this is the case for something a, a protein like hemoglobin. Okay, so recall from hemoglobin that you have a protein that's the hemoglobin itself, but the problem is is when we defined um, the equilibrium expression in the last video, we defined it as P plus L is in equilibrium with PL, right? But what's the problem with hemoglobin? There's multiple ligands. And so for a generic protein, we're going to define um, the ligand concentration as NL, where N is the number of ligands, and so that's in equilibrium with PL sub N, where N is the number of ligands, okay? So if we define a constant for this equation, what does it become? Well, you take the product of the products, right, divided by the products of the reactants. So that's concentration of products times the ligand concentration. But what happens when you have what happens when you have a coefficient out in front of one of the um, one of the um, reactants or products? It becomes an exponent in the equilibrium expression, right? So when we apply this equilibrium expression to our theta equation, we also too have to include these exponents on the ligand. So L concentrations will have an N exponent on them. Okay. Now, what we ultimately want to do is we want to solve for N eventually. Okay. So what we can do is we can do some some nifty rearrangements of this expression. We can get theta divided by 1 minus theta is equal to the ligand concentration raised to the n power right, divided by the dissociation constant. Okay. And now what we can do is we can take the log of both sides. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the log of both sides. So and this is the log base 10 by the way. So when we take the log of both sides what do we get? We get the log of theta divided by 1 minus theta is equal to, um, recall that whenever you're taking the log, using the log functions, if you have an exponent, right, you have an exponent and you take the log of that term, you can bring the exponent down in front of the log. And when you're taking the log of a quotient, it becomes the difference of the two logarithms. So you end up getting n times the log of the ligand concentration, right? minus the log of the dissociation constant, right, Kd, okay? And this is a nifty expression because then we can solve for effectively um, the maximum Hill coefficient, okay? And the maximum Hill coefficient is essentially um, the Hill coefficient where you have maximum cooperativity. So what happens when you have maximum cooperativity, okay? Maximum cooperativity is where the number one, the binding of ligand to the protein is completely cooperative, but that means that all binding sites on the protein would have bound ligands simultaneously, so no protein molecules would be uh, partially saturated. Okay, so what that means is that as soon as, assuming you had your maximum n value, okay, that would imply that as soon as the first oxygen molecule bound to hemoglobin every one of the other binding sites would immediately be saturated with the ligand, which is oxygen, right? And in every single hemoglobin, there would be absolutely no partially saturated hemoglobin, okay? Now, in practice, an, the n value that you calculate from this equation, um, you're, you're never going to get there in reality. This is just a, 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 a theoretically maximized n value, okay? And what we'll find is that when we actually uh, graph uh, the graph, um, when we make the graph to find n in actuality, in other words, the, the practical n, 
um, it's never going to um, match up with the n that we calculate from this equation. Okay, so what we can do is is to solve for n to get the maximum n possible, we can add log of kd to both sides, right? So I can get that log of theta divided by 1 minus theta plus the log of kd, right? And then to isolate n, I can divide, I can divide by log of the concentration of ligand, right? And that gives me my maximum Hill coefficient. So these n values that we're getting are called Hill coefficients, okay? And the Hill coefficient, this, this would be n sub t, I guess you would call it, the theoretical one, okay? In actuality, um, the, the, um, the actual or the theoretical Hill coefficient will never equal um, the Hill coefficient that you actually get from your data. And like I said, the theoretical Hill coefficient is basically what you would get if, if when one molecule of the ligand bound to the protein, that every one of the ligand sites were simultaneously bound and you had absolutely no partially saturated protein. Okay, But in reality, you're never going to have that. So the N actual that you get from graphing this, as we'll do in a minute, is going to be less than your theoretical N that you calculate with that formula. Okay. So what we can do is we can make a plot. And what we're about to do is called a hill plot. Okay. And so on the y-axis, we're going to say that y is going to be equal to the function log of theta minus 1 over, or excuse me, log over of theta divided by 1 minus theta. And then on the x-axis, x is going to be equal to the log of the partial pressure of O2. Okay, PO2. Okay. So what happens? So we're going to using our data, we're going to generate a curve, right? And a curve is going to have some shape. And what we can do is we can basically measure the slope. What's the slope? The slope is just the slope is just dy dx, right? That's the slope, right? So dy dx is the slope. So um, if you were able to um, if you're able to mimic get a function that mimics your curve, you could just take the derivative of it. However, if you if you have, say, if you if you had this and you say, okay, well, this segment is pretty straight, then you can pretty much assume that the slope is equal to delta y is equal to delta y over delta x. Okay? And you can pretty much assume that that's your slope. Okay? So your slope, so your slope slope dy dx effectively what you calculate from the graph is your slope is your hill coefficient so the hill coefficient we we say is n sub h okay now the various values of your hill coefficient dy dx um, basically tells you a lot about the binding of of the protein with respect to the ligands okay so what so let's make a graph Let's make a graph. So let's say this is dy dx. Let's say that um, this is degree of cooperativity. So we'll make a, a graph, right? And we'll figure out what the degree of cooperativity is. Okay. So what happens if your, your slope, your hill coefficient, your dy dx is greater than 1? What happens? This is what you have when you have positive cooperativity. So remember that po positive cooperativity was basically whenever you um, had the binding of one ligand made it more favorable for the binding of the next ligand and so forth. And so if we're talking about hemoglobin, we would expect to have dy dx greater than 1, right? What happens if... What happens if dy dx equals 1? Then you have no cooperativity. Okay? So if dy dx is equal to 1, you have no cooperativity. So you could probably guess what it means when dy dx is less than 1. What is it? You have negative cooperativity. Okay? And I will say this right now. Negative cooperativity, the, the actual cases where you find it, where they're well documented, are rare. So positive cooperativity is observed significantly more than negative. You almost 
I honestly can't think of a, a, a single point where you have negative cooperativity. I'd have to look it up to see if there is. It, it's that rare. Okay. And what happens? What happens if dy dx that you calculate from the graph equals m? What happens? Remember that if the slope that you calculate from your hill plot equals the n that you calculate from that equation, you have 100% cooperativity. And in, in practice, that's never observed, okay? Um, theoretically, n should be equal to um, the maximum cooperativity possible, okay? And it's just your, your maximum slope possible. But in reality, that can never happen. So recall that dy dx, that was just equal to n sub h, your hill coefficient. And n sub h is the hill coefficient that you calculate from your graph. So effectively what you're doing with this hill plot is you're, you're, you're experimentally determining what your hill coefficient is, and your n sub h hill coefficient, dy dx, is just going to be, um, it's going to help you determine what kind of, um, what kind of cooperativity you have. Now, in, in, in the lab, if you get a dy dx that's less than 1, you probably want to go back and make sure you did it correctly, and that's just because negative cooperativity is very rare. Now, if you get if you are using hemoglobin for this equation and you generate a hill plot, you should expect to see positive cooperativity. Okay? There are a lot of proteins that don't have cooperativity, so you should get a number around 1 for, for that. Okay, so I hope this video helped you give it a little, a little intuitive sense on hill coefficients and why they're useful. See you in the next video.